This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. Built for tough. 1984. Ronald Reagan defeats Walter Mondale for a second term as president. Los Angeles hosts the Summer Olympics and a man shoots up a McDonald's in San Diego in America's deadliest mass shooting. For a few years, anyway. The first TED conference is held, the discovery of the AIDS virus is officially announced by American scientists, and Apple Computers releases the Macintosh, introduced by one of the most famous Super Bowl commercials of all time, directed by Ridley Scott. Another famous commercial, the Wendy's Where's the Beef Lady? While the American video game market was crashing, Alexei Pachinov releases Tetris in Soviet Russia. In theaters, Ghostbusters, Gremlins, and The Karate Kid. In music, Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA, Prince's Purple Rain, and the premiere of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And we see the births of Katy Perry, Avril Lavigne, and Mark Zuckerberg. On television, toy-driven animation continues to expand with shows like The Transformers, My Little Pony, and Snorks. Alex Trebek makes his debut as the host of Jeopardy, and Happy Days aired their last episode. On cable television, Lifetime and American Movie Classics premiered, ABC purchased a majority stake in ESPN, and in October, the Turner Broadcasting System premiered the Cable Music Channel, or CMC, the first direct competitor to Warner Amex's MTV. Well, it's a very exciting uh, to, to start another Another network, uh, our fourth, and I, I know you know what uh, we're going to do. We're going to play a, a wider range of music. We're going to stay away from uh, the excessively violent or degrading uh, clips towards towards women that MTV has has been so so fond of so fond of running. So we, hold on a few seconds. Okay, push it. All right, here we go. Take that, MTV. While Warner was busy selling off their Atari assets in the face of the video game collapse, MTV was stepping up as the best thing the company had going for it. With $15.4 million in ad revenue, Nickelodeon's younger sibling was becoming one of the most successful channels in early cable, even though Warner Amex still had a $99 million deficit in 1983. Warner Amex was in trouble. It had narrowly avoided a hostile takeover from media mogul Rupert Murdoch, and things had to change, and they had to change fast. In 1983, Andrew Lewis replaced Gustav Hauser as the chairman and CEO of Warner Amex Cable Communications. He had formerly been President Reagan's Secretary of Transportation and had presided over the firing of striking air traffic controllers in 1981, so, you know, nice guy. The Cube Cable program, where Pinwheel and a lot of Nickelodeon's early programming had been developed, closed down in January of 1984. Then, in February, MTV Networks was incorporated and made into a public offering. What that means in very oversimplified terms is that Warner Amex separated MTV into its own company, separated it from the larger Warner Amex cable operations, and then listed MTV Networks on the stock exchange with 5 million shares in common stocks. This allowed for two things. One, it made a much more appealing investment for shareholders. Warner Amex had a weak reputation, MTV had a great reputation, and was destroying the competition in five weeks' time. Two, it gave Warner Amex the option to sell MTV networks without destroying their entire cable network. So if Warner needed to pay back all that money they borrowed from American Express, they could sell MTV networks to, oh, let's make up a company, Biacom or something. Oh, and I should point out that MTV Networks included a few other channels besides MTV, one of which was Nickelodeon. More leadership changes happened. 
Jack Schneider, no relation to Psy, was fired from the position of president of the Warner Amex Satellites Entertainment Company and was replaced by Warner executive David Horowitz, while Robert Pittman, one of the creators of MTV, was made president of MTV Networks. And while these changes would prove necessary for the continued existence of both MTV and Nickelodeon, there was one man who wasn't pleased with it. Our old friend Cy Schneider. Everybody, please take off your hats out of respect because we finally reached the end of the Schneider era. Bob Pittman was made head of the company and it was clear that Cy, who was at least 20 years his senior, was uncomfortable with this crazy, idiotic approach to home-based television. Bob Pittman was too new blood for Cy Schneider's tastes, and Jack Snyder had been a friend who had gotten Cy the job at Nickelodeon in the first place. Nickelodeon had not found the success it needed during his tenure, and allowances were drying up fast. When Warner Amex was riding high on Atari and MTV's early success, Nickelodeon being a lost leader was acceptable, and Schneider could keep doing his thing. But now with the video game crash and the MTV network, the pressure was on, and Schneider was finding less joy from the experience. I don't know the exact date Cy Schneider left Nickelodeon, but I do know that in May of 1984, advertising agency Basel & Jacobs announced Cy Schneider as the new chairman of their Western United States operation, and he began working there in September 1st of that year. Cyril M. Schneider would continue to work with Basel and Jacobs until his death from cancer on February 22nd, 1994, at the age of 64. In a way, I feel sorry for Schneider and his legacy with Nickelodeon. His era, known mockingly if not inaccurately as the Green Vegetable period, had a lot of the ingredients that would make Nickelodeon successful. He was the one who signed off on You Can't Do That on Television, after all. He managed to bring in a lot of quality programs, even if they didn't make the channel popular. The major problem Schneider had in terms of program selection and selling the channel was that he was too backwards looking, implementing older models of television when, being the first all children's program channel for a still new medium of cable, he probably should have been a bit more cutting edge. Also, as we'll explore in a little bit, he wasn't the best people person. So Schneider was out before the year was half up and a position needed to be filled. Geraldine Laybourne had been Nickelodeon's programming manager since 1980, coming in about the same time Schneider did. Her background hadn't been in entertainment, but education. Before Nickelodeon, Laybourne had been a private school teacher, then started a nonprofit called the Media Center for Children, whose goal was to work with teachers in developing media-based curriculum. In 1978, Jerry Laybourne teamed up with her husband, Kit Laybourne, and animator Eli Noyes, to form the production company Early Bird Specials, whose goal was to get independent filmmakers on television. So our first project was with Nickelodeon, and it was, we did two pilots for Nickelodeon in 1979, and um, they were very esoteric and very way out there. I, don't, I still don't think the world was ready for them. Nickelodeon didn't buy her shows, but instead offered Jerry Laybourne the program manager position, a role that would primarily have her finding potential acquisitions for the channel and pitching them to Schneider. While Schneider had the final decision, it's fair to say that some of the most iconic shows of this era, like You Can't Do That on Television and Today's Special, probably would never have passed his desk without Laybourne. Laybourne quickly became frustrated with what she felt was a lack of ambition and mismanagement of the channel. The goals for Nick were so low. The expressed view was that all we should worry about was being on time and on budget. There was no notion that we should be trying to figure out how to relate to kids or delivering something to them that they couldn't get anywhere else. There was no recognition that we might be able to turn the network into something terrific if we worked hard enough and were creative about it. With Schneider leaving his post before the summer of 1984, someone needed to fill in the role of head of the network. The transition between Schneider and Laybourne was an immediate. Warner Amex wanted to shop around for a little bit, but in the meantime, Bob Pittman gave Laybourne a temporary promotion, putting her in charge of the first network for kids. One of the first things Laybourne did was to get everyone who worked for the company into one room. Schneider had run things in a hierarchical system, where departments reported directly to him, but had very little communication with each other. 
There were no group meetings, so nobody knew what everyone else was doing. The whole hierarchical system is built upon the belief that if one person is up, another person has to be down. I would have meetings with Sy Schneider, but what they were really about was him showing how much smarter he was than me. I would always leave those meetings deflated. I could feel my effectiveness and motivation drain out of me as a result. So I figured that if I felt that way, the impact on people who are not as confident must be devastating. What you really had then was the boss creating this environment in which people had low motivation. Plus, they were so afraid of making mistakes or looking foolish that they were too inhibited to be creative. So Jerry Laybourne's first order of business as the person in charge, get everybody in the same room together and talk about the future of the channel. The first thing that was really great that we did was I actually took everybody who was currently at Nickelodeon at the time, 20 people, and I just took them off site for a day and said, okay, we've been here for three and a half years. We've seen what we've done. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. Let's just get it up on the board. Let's analyze this. Let's figure out what do we want it to be. And in the course of that period of time, which was a very intense summer, we actually ended up um, shaping what Nickelodeon was going to become. It was a very, very profound summer. And some of the people who were there didn't want to get on board and couldn't get on board and couldn't, couldn't um, be flexible with us. And they ended up leaving. So we, had, we were down to 15. So the Nickelodeon crew was trimmed down to the bone, but everybody was now on the same page, and a game plan for Nick's future was developing. So a few of the people on Team Laybourne. Debbie Beese, the 28-year-old Senior Vice President of Programming. Jeffrey Darby, co-writer of You Can't Do That on Television, now promoted to Senior Vice President of Production. Scott Webb, a transplant from the Movie Channel and the now Creative Director. Anne Sweeney, the Manager of Programming Service and Commercial Clearance, more on that in a moment. And Linda Kahn, the new Director of Acquisitions. You'll see her name pop up a lot because a part of her role was to send out promotional quotes to newspapers. Another change Nickelodeon made that year was the introduction of advertising. The channel would no longer be a commercial-free zone. Some people, naturally, didn't like this. The Peggy Charons of the world worried that the channel being influenced by advertisers would bring the content of the channel towards the sugary sweet Saturday morning cartoon fair, and a few kids were disappointed in the decrease of shorts airing between programs. But Jerry Laybourne was very careful about what products were allowed to advertise on the channel. More violent toys like laser tag were passed on, even if they would have brought a great amount of income to the channel. Along with commercials, a new visual brand for the channel was put into development. But this video is running long enough, so I'm going to save the story of the Nickelodeon splat for another episode. Suffice it to say, 1984 was a year of great change for Nickelodeon. Three shows entered their run this year. The Tomorrow People, Dusty's Treehouse, and finally, what will they think of next? And eight new shows were added two original programs, and six acquired programs, including, I'm so happy to announce, multiple animated programs. Yes, 1984 was the year cartoons arrived to Nickelodeon. Now, for some of these shows, it's not easy to tell what was a Jerry Laybourne acquisition and what was a leftover Cy Schneider acquisition. Even if they premiered after Schneider left the channel, they could still have been from contracts Schneider wrote up prior to his departure. Consider the subject of today's episode of Nick Knacks, Powerhouse. Every weekend on the Kids Only Weekend, Powerhouse. They solve crime. They stop trouble. They're the kids from Powerhouse. And they're on every weekend at 7 a.m. 6 central on Nickelodeon. Powerhouse premiered on Nickelodeon in October of 1984, months into Laybourne's tenure, but it has all the signifiers of a standard Schneider-era show. It was a former PBS program, one that touched on heavier, multicultural subjects like Vegetable Soup did. At just 16 episodes, it didn't have enough material to rerun constantly, but rerun it they did. And you might be able to make the case of this show emulating previous television successes, as Powerhouse is basically Hill Street Blues for kids. Running on one 16-episode season, Powerhouse was produced by the Educational Film Center, a production company based out of Northern Virginia. Filmed in Washington, D.C., this is the story of Brenda, 
a young woman who recently inherited a former boxing gym from her father. She looks to turn it into the powerhouse community center, but the building is being used by a small gang of drug pushers who want her gone. As Brenda cleans up the powerhouse, she draws the attention and support of some of the kids in the community. There's Kevin, the athlete with a heart of gold, Jennifer, who's interested in community projects and owns a VW bus, Lolo, the socially awkward boy genius, and Pepper, a little weirdo who likes to spy on people. Not willing to give up their turf, the pushers send in one of their own, a guy named Tony, to pretend to be friends with the powerhouse kids, get someone on the inside who can sabotage them later. However, the longer Tony hangs out with the powerhouse kids, the more he comes to like them, and soon enough, he switched sides, though perhaps a little too late. Well, we received some information uh, there's a possibility of drugs on the premises. Oh, no, 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 that's ridiculous. Do you have a warrant? Yes, Councilwoman, I'm afraid I do. <laughs> hey, Lieutenant. I'm off the sign, Miss Gaines, but I don't have much choice. I'm going to have to take you downtown. With Brenda arrested on drug charges, the powerhouse kids take it upon themselves to track down the leader of this little gang, someone even Tony hasn't seen as they opt to communicate over the phone with a disguised voice. Pastor? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, we may have a problem at the old gym. Some broad's trying to move in. Something about it. You want me to lean on her or what? I don't care what you do, just get rid of her. All right. Through sneaking, disguises, and stealing drug money, the powerhouse kids discover that it's actually a city councilwoman with a personal vendetta against Brenda who's running the operation. After kidnappings and chases, the kids expose the councilwoman, clear Brenda's name, and the powerhouse can open in earnest. And if you're thinking, wow, that's an exceptionally action-heavy pilot for a PBS show, Powerhouse is an exceptionally action-heavy PBS show, full stop. What's hilarious is that PBS still had to sell this program as part of their educational children's television line, which included the usual practice of sending packages to educators should they want to utilize the show in the classroom. I happen to have those documents on hand, and the contrast between what it says the show is about and what the show is actually about is amazing. For example, here's what it says about the show's third episode, Life or Breath. The powerhouse program, Life or Breath, shows young people dealing with the physical symptoms of stress. It demonstrates some relaxation techniques that can help the young people in your group, and you, ease tension. And yes, the episode has a kid, played here by a very young Phil Lewis of the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody fame, who has a stomach problem due to stress, and Brenda does teach him some basic exercises to help manage it. Learning how to relax through exercises and breathing won't erase the causes of your problems, but it can help to keep stress from giving you headaches, shortness of breath, and other problems. One, two, three. But that's not what the episode is about. The episode is about the son of an ambassador from an African country being kidnapped by terrorists and the powerhouse gang having to track him down and save him. You idiot! You should have died him! Now he must be killed. This changes all of our plans. The here's how to breathe to calm your nerve stuff just gets lost in this action-heavy political thriller. Every episode of Powerhouse is like this. You've got these five kids going above their pay grade, taking on life or death situations, and then some kind of moral to satisfy PBS's educational requirements. Here's an episode where a bank robber sets up a fake gym so that he can kidnap and possibly murder by sauna the owner of a diner that sits next to the bank in this strip mall, so the bank robber can tunnel through the wall of the diner into the bank vault. But also, this is about loving the body you have and not giving in to get-fit-quick schemes. 
We've got diamond thieves. We've got people fixing horse races. We've got a woman who catches a lethal plague from the jungle and is now spreading it around the city. Sure, practice makes perfect is a nice lesson for the kids, but maybe we shouldn't be teaching practice makes perfect in an episode where the powerhouse gang is practicing for a museum heist. Look, we can make minor adjustments to Lolo's time schedule, but we have all got to pull together. This plan can work. As long as nobody recognizes us. This episode's great. So the head of security at this museum gets let go after they install a new high-tech security system. Cameras, pressure plates, the works. So this woman hires the powerhouse kids to help her break into the museum and steal a statue to show the museum how much they need her over this crummy security system. It's this fun heist episode and also super illegal. Hey kids, it's okay to steal so long as you do it for the right reasons and have adult supervision. And remember, practice makes perfect. Now, in fairness, sometimes an episode's message did complement its plot, but only when the message was likewise pretty heavy. Subjects like young parenting and teenage drinking were broached, so long as the plot could include a chase scene. There always has to be a chase scene. Now, I don't think this stuff is too intense for young viewers. You can find similar amounts of action and serious content in your average Hardy Boys or Nancy Drew book. No, it, it's fine for kids, but it does seem uncharacteristic for a PBS children's show. Not entirely. The inner city setting was a go-to for PBS shows like Sesame Street and The Electric Company, as that was also largely the demographic for these shows. But the gritty, high-grain filmmaking, the amount of professional crime on display, the action and violence drowning out the morals, this doesn't feel like a PBS show. It feels like it should be on afternoon network television between episodes of Kojak and Quincy M.E. To help balance things out, each episode also had six little short pieces, or uncommercials as they were officially called, that played at the beginning, middle, and end of each episode. The nature of these uncommercials varied from kid on the street questionnaires to little skits about safety and animated segments about parts of the body and how they keep them healthy. It's Celebrity Organ. Will our mystery guest please sign in? Welcome, sir. Please tell us what you do. You beat a hundred thousand times a day. Oh, you're really a muscle. You pump blood to bring oxygen to body cells. Remarkable. Uh, can you tell our viewers how to build strong hearts? <laughs> Exercise, you say. Running, swimming, biking, walking. <laughs> rescuing people. Anything <laughs> active, I see. What further advice do you have? <laughs> Don't hurt your heart. Well, how does that <laughs> Too much sugar in animal fat is bad for the heart. <laughs> Smoking, very bad, uh-huh. Can cause permanent heart damage. Thank you, Art. Now, could you give our viewers a little hint as to whose heart you actually are? Take care of your heart. A great way to be a powerhouse. There were a total of 37 unique uncommercials in the show, which sounds like a decent amount, but six of them an episode, with 16 episodes in total, means it's not long before they start repeating themselves. There's certainly more in the PBS spirit of things, and I wonder if they were a compromise, like PBS wouldn't have accepted the show without them. That's just speculation, though. One other thing of note is that in each episode, there'd be a short shout-out to various youth groups across the United States. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, 4-H, that sort of thing. To our Red Cross friends in Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, for their counseling work with Vietnamese refugees, way to go! Stay tuned, Powerhouse will be right back. The Wikipedia page for this show is riddled with errors. It credits the show's creation to someone named Mark Johnson, who as far as I can tell doesn't exist. That name's not in the credits nor on the IMDb page. Also it claims the show had two unaired episodes with big citation needed markers right next to it. 
I haven't found press releases that imply that there was ever an 18 episode order, and looking into previous versions of the wiki page, I found a since deleted controversy section that says one of the episodes was unaired because virtually every shot had a horse penis in it. Yeah, these lost episodes are just some leftover vandalism. The show's creation should really go to Ira H. Klugerman and Ruth Polak, joint CEOs of Educational Film Center and creatives in their own right, Klugerman serving as the show's executive producer and Pollack as the show's writer. The concept behind the house is that you can always find out things about yourself that will surprise you. The concept is dear to me. The whole idea of building competence and confidence in people. If you don't try, nothing will be gained. Powerhouse is full of that. The role of Brenda was played by Sandra Bowie who at the time of being cast was head of the acting program at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Playing the authoritative adult role of the show, Bowie found herself doing a lot of press junkets in 82. Here she is giving a rather startling quote about the show's intent with its multiracial cast. Obviously, it was done on purpose, because the need to have children of all these backgrounds identify with the characters. During the year we spent filming, we discussed this very often, so we could bring believability to the group. It involves, with so much at stake in the many adventures, putting one's whole trust into somebody of another racial or religious background. That couldn't happen here in Washington, at least not at this time. So we call the whole thing an action-adventure fantasy. The racial mix is part of the fantasy, but it could happen. Wow, a black woman telling you the kids of other races being friends in Washington DC is an aspirational fiction is a strong statement, and one that demonstrates that racism didn't end with the civil rights movement like so many privileged white people seem to think. Issues of race were largely a background theme for the show, but the most intense of the show's 16 episodes brings it front and center. In the episode Celebration, Lolo is preparing for his bar mitzvah when his synagogue is attacked by a small white supremacist bike gang called the White Cobras. The powerhouse gang responds by trying to humiliate them. Hey, horse face, what do you want to do tonight? Hey, fat what do you want to do tonight? Sure what I want to do tonight. Maybe, let's see, I would like to give one of them Negro churches all balls. Negro church? Yeah. Hey, I got a better idea, than that. There's a Puerto Rican street dance band who goes off the water. Not now, Tony. Not now, not like that. Huh? What's going on? Who's out there? Hi. I'm a member of that uh, Negro church you wanted to visit. You know the one on 4th Street? Oh, what the hell? He's crazy. Hey, we heard you wanted to go to the Puerto Rican street dance tonight. I came to offer you a formal invitation. This, however, is only a half measure and the White Cobras respond by just delivering all the racism. Just all of the racism. So what about the bar mitzvah, Lola? Three days, no sign of the Cobras. Yeah, you can call it back on now if you want to. I never told the rabbi it was off. Awesome. Hey, Lola, what's going on? Those guys are a disease. Let's go. Hey, wait a second. Don't go to an open mine. You want me to open it for you? That's yeah, okay. It's as startling and as intense of an episode of television today as it would have been in the early 80s. At the time of this writing, the Poe synagogue shooting was only a week ago an act carried out by a young white supremacist terrorist not too unlike the White Cobras in this episode. And it's staggering how little things have changed in the near 40 years since this episode aired. Writer Ruth Pollock made sure to get the input of people with experiences unlike hers in order to make this realistic. We planned a show on prejudice that was very difficult to write. When we thought we had it to a point where it made sense, we invited the cast to talk about it. They got very involved and had extremely strong feelings. As a result, I rewrote about 40% of the script. While Powerhouse covers a wider range of topics than Vegetable Soup, they do share an attitude, a directness, and an intensity that feels largely absent from today's television. 
What's an odd fit for the public broadcasting service is a pretty dang good fit for Nickelodeon. As Cy Schneider's PBS You Paid For It era began to fade away into something new, Powerhouse's adventure-heavy plots became a good candidate to survive the transition. Both educational and exciting. Best of both worlds. Powerhouse covers a broad range of topics, including friendship, illness, prejudice, and competition. Each exciting adventure will challenge and entertain Nickelodeon viewers, as well as provide them with valuable information about mental and physical health. The format of a diverse group of kids having adventures while being watched over by one adult would echo in some of Nickelodeon's original projects, like Hey Dude and Salute Your Shorts, though obviously those shows are a lot less intense. Sadly, no home video release of Powerhouse exists, but as of this writing you can find it all on YouTube, though you have probably noticed that they don't have the best sound quality. Powerhouse is a wonderfully fascinating show, one that tugs itself in a lot of directions, and while it maybe doesn't pull everything off, what it does manage is admirable. And for that, I think it's the best way to kick off Nickelodeon 1984. One foot in the safe and educational, one foot into the exciting, experimental, and adventurous. 1984. What a year. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time, a breakfast cereal hires the friendliest man in tennis to teach us how to play games. Today's research shout-out goes to The Web of Inclusion, Architecture for Building Great Organizations by Sally Helgenson. This book includes an entire chapter on Jerry Laybourne and is probably the most detailed and extensive account on the transition of power between her and Cy Schneider. I'll no doubt be referring to it multiple times in the future. Thank you all for watching! And welcome to Nicknacks 1984, a very exciting time as this is when Nickelodeon introduced animation to his lineup. If you'd like to support Nicknacks, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar is a step towards better research materials, higher production values, and making sure I keep the bills paid. You can also support the channel by liking this video, leaving a comment, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, following me on Twitter for updates, sending a one-time donation through coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. Thank you all for watching.